Hi everybody and welcome to lecture three of the digital VLSI design course at bar -Ilan University. Today we'll start talking about logic synthesis. This is part one of a two-part lecture. In this lecture we'll focus mainly on standard cell libraries but um, we'll also discuss logic synthesis as a whole. In part two we'll go into the nitty-gritty nuts and bolts of logic synthesis. So let's start with an introduction. What is logic synthesis? So synthesis is the process that converts RTL into a technology-specific gate-level netlist optimized for a set of predefined constraints. What that means is you start with a behavioral RTL design, a standard cell library, and a set of design constraints. If we look at this graphically, we have a standard cell library, which we'll discuss in depth today, and a set of design constraints, which we'll discuss in lecture five. Then we have our RTL description over here, which just describes a simple counter. We take that, we put it into our synthesis tool, and it spits out a netlist, a gate level netlist mapped to the standard cell library. So as you see here, we have all these standard cells, and they're instantiated with all the connectivity between them. So this is a gate level netlist. It's a list of nets and how they connect to the different gates inside. Um, it works for, uh, for not only for ASICs, but also for FPGAs. There we'll map it to lookup tables and uh, different pieces that are already synthesized inside the FPGA. Um, hopefully, the, what we get is uh, efficient in terms of speed, area, power, etc. So mathematically, we're given a finite state machine, f of x, y, z, lambda, and delta where X is the input alphabet, Y is the output alphabet, Z is a set of internal states, and lambda is a next state function from X to Z, X, Z to Z, and delta is a output function from X, Z to Y. Okay, and what the synthesis does is it takes this um, finite state machine that we had here, the inputs, um, the, the, the function, the outputs, and the current state, which is also input, and it turns it into a target circuit C of G and W, where G is a set of circuit components, that's uh, Boolean gates, flip-flops, etc., everything we see here, and W is a set of wires that are connecting uh, G together. So why do we want to perform logic synthesis? So uh, it's pretty clear, I guess, but um, it wasn't always, and in fact it ran into all kinds of, uh, um, ob uh, of objection at uh, first when they first introduced it. But what logic synthesis will do, it will automatically manage many details of the design processes, um, causing many fewer bugs. It will obviously improve productivity instead of drawing our gates and our logic by hand. And it abstracts the design data, the HDL description, from any particular implementation technology. And therefore, we can take our designs and move them from one technology to the other very easily. Um, in, some, in some cases, we can get a much more optimal design than you could get by hand, um, basically because the complexity is so hard, it's really hard to do it uh, by hand. The reason not to do logic synthesis, well, there aren't very many nowadays, but uh, in some cases, we may have uh, a priori knowledge of the design and we can do better things by ourselves. So just a simple example here, we have a module called Foo with a bunch of inputs and this always block, it's a combinatorial always block with uh, these inputs. And all it's going to do, it's going to have some sort of if statement, which is some sort of a mux, we guess, that uh, in one case it'll output an A, in another case a B, but we have this very strange type of a statement here that we have to draw and maybe make some sort of a Carnot map or something to see what it actually is. Well, the synthesizer can deal with such a simple, trivial uh, problem very easily and figure out that all this is actually is an OR gate. So um, that's something that was pretty hard for us to do in our head. Um, it wasn't that hard probably if we drew the circuit and tried to see what that logic does, but when once we start getting many more input variables and uh, a lot more complex function, uh, it's going to be really hard, almost impossible to do by hand. So what are our goals when we do logic synthesis? So the first goal is to minimize the area. Um, area is in terms of literal count. We'll discuss that in part two of this lecture. Um, uh, there's also cell count, register count, all, all kinds of other metrics that we try to minimize. 
we are obviously trying to maximize performance. So we're going to try to get the maximum clock frequency or at least make the clock frequency that was determined to us through, through the constraints that we'll learn about. Um, we're going to try to minimize power. We're going to try to minimize the switching activity in, indiv in individual gates, de uh, deactivated circuit blocks, etc. And of course, as in most optimization problems, we're going to try to find um, the best combination of the above. Um, we're going to give different weights to each problem. Um, maybe one design wants a smaller area, another design wants higher performance, etc. And so we formulate some sort of a constraint problem saying something like minimize the area of a clock speed that is at least 300 megahertz. For more global objectives, um, we can get some feedback from layout. We get actual physical sizes, delays, placement and routing and try to put that into our optimization problem. So how does uh, this work? Well, just as a very high level uh, description of this, we have a variety of general and ad hoc methods. For example, instantiation. So we have these primitives like AND gates, OR gates, XOR gates, or functions, rather that we can instantiate. So if we run into an OR um, operator in the Verilog, what we can do is just take one of these OR uh, um, primitives that we have in, inside our synthesis tool and replace it with that. We can do what we call macro expansion or substitution. So if we run into a more complex type of a behavioral uh, uh, description, such as a plus, okay, when we want to do addition of uh, two 32-bit words or something, that's not just a full adder or something like that. We have all kinds of, you know, carry look ahead adders or ripple carry adders, and um, our tool can replace them with one of those architectures. Or if we have constructs such as an if else or a case or something, we can expand it into such special circuits. Um, we have all kinds of functions that can tell our tool what these different operators inside the Verilog should be substituted with. Inference. So inference is when we run into a special pattern that's in the in the language description and we can do something with it. Um, inference often or most often uh, uh, refers to inferring uh, sequential elements. So if we run into an always at pause edge clock block. Um, the tool will look for flip-flops that, um, that actually describe what's happening inside. And uh, we have all kinds of different types of flip-flop primitives inside our design, such as a synchronous, asynchronous reset, uh, enable flip-flops, etc. Logic optimization. This is something that um, the synthesizer will do after reading in the design and turning it into some sort of internal database. And it will start uh, trying to group together the Boolean operations and optimize uh, with logic minimization techniques. And finally, we have structural reorganization, which means that we don't only have to take the, um, the Boolean logic as is, we can also play all kinds of games like retiming of circuits, which we'll discuss in, a, in, a, in the next lecture. So um, let's look at a basic uh, synthesis flow. This is very high level. Um, you will understand the different parts of this as we go on with this lecture and the next. So um, we're going to start with syntax analysis. Okay, we're going to read in the hardware description language files and check for syntax errors um, in Cadence Genus. That will be done with uh, the read HDL command. Um, so we're going to read our Verilog file, basically. The next stage, which we're going to discuss uh, predominantly in this lecture, is the library definition stage. The library definition stage is telling um, the synthesis tool what our technology is, um, what our leaf cells are, in other words, what types of IPs we have inside that we're going to use, and so forth. So we do that with uh, a, a type of a, of a command such as read libs, which reads a file with a .lib extension, which we'll describe later as the Liberty file. Um, but in general, it's telling the synthesis tool what our technology is, what our hard macros are, what our standard cells and IPs, etc. are. Elaboration and binding is the next stage, and this is the actual first step of synthesis, um, which 
is when we convert the RTL into a Boolean structure, and then we start running all kinds of optimizations uh, according to computational Boolean algebra, all kinds of state reduction, encoding, re register inferring, and um, when we reach all kinds of leaf cells that we don't know what to do with, such as a, an IP, like an SRAM block or an IO cell, or some sort of an analog block, um, and also when we run into things like uh, instantiated standard cells, what we have to do is bind them, which means basically point to one of these actual IPs and say, okay, we stop here and we don't continue trying to uh, optimize those. So um, the type of, uh, of command inside Genus is to elaborate and you can also describe what your top level uh, module is. Okay, uh, the next stage, after we've done the elaboration, we basically have some sort of a structural model of what our, uh, what our design is inside um, the database of the tool. So now we can know where the, what the top level ports are and we have different, we can go and uh, traverse the logic and so forth, which means that we can actually define our constraints, how fast we want to go and all kinds of other things like that. Um, we have a, a lot to discuss about constraints. I uh, am only gonna, I'm gonna defer that to lecture five, so I'm not gonna go into constraints right now. But uh, in general, we usually use a format called SDC, Synopsis Design Constraints, even though there are other ways of defining constraints. And so we use a command such as read SDC and point to the SDC file to uh, define those. Next, we go into what we call pre-mapping optimization. So basically, we take our, our Boolean logic that we've elaborated with, with our uh, binding, and we map to these generic cells that are internal to the, to the um, tool, which represent kind of standard cells that it would generally find in a library, and do all kinds of heuristics and optimizations on that. Next, we go to a very important stage called technology mapping, which this is where the tool actually connects just this RTL behavioral description that is, uh, is independent of the technology. It maps it to the actual standard cells um, with real delays and real, um, and real uh, limitations or, or features of the standard cell library. Post mapping, mapping optimization is iterating over to design, doing all kinds of things, running all kinds of heuristics and optimizations, trying to change um, what we're doing. So in, uh, in Cadence Genus, we have three stages, syn generic, syn map, and syn opt that do these three stages of, of uh, logic synthesis. Finally, once we've finished, we have to see what our results are like. So first we'll start with a lot of reports. We'll, um, we want to look at the timing, for instance, of the design. We want to look at the size, uh, the size estimation, uh, what kind of gates we're using and so forth. So we use a, uh, all kinds of report commands. And once we finished and we're happy with what we got, we're gonna need to move on to our, uh, our physical implementation, our place and route tool. And for that, we have to export the results of what we got. Uh, for example, here, the write HDL command will export the netlist, the gate level netlist in structural Verilog.